Eastern on C-SPAN 2. Now a house hearing on possible health effects of cell phone use. We'll hear from researchers who say that cell phone use may increase the risk of brain cancer and of tumors that damage hearing nerves. This runs two hours, five minutes. Committee will come to order. Uh, before we begin, I just uh, want to thank all of you for being here, but share with you that we're at a uh, time in our nation's history where there are events that have developed of great import with respect to the economy. And uh, I felt it was necessary to go forward with this hearing, particularly because so many people made efforts to be here and because of the importance of the subject. There will be members of Congress who will be coming in and out uh, during the course of this hearing, I'm hopeful. Uh, and the ranking member, Mr. Issa, who is also very involved in uh, some of the economic issues that we're talking about, has communicated to me that he asked uh, me to start the hearing uh, without him. Usually we start uh, with he and I beginning together. Uh, but uh, with Mr. Issa's uh, permission, uh, I'm going to uh, begin so that we can uh, move quickly to get the testimony on the record of the people who are here today. So uh, this is the uh, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on Domestic Policy. I'm Congressman Dennis Kucinich, the Chairman of the Subcommittee. Today's hearing will examine what science is saying about the potential links between long-term use of cell phones and tumors or other health effects. Uh, without objection, uh, the Chair and the Ranking Minority Member We'll have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who appears and seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. Cell phones have evolved from a clunky novelty to a sleek utility. They have become indispensable and, for many, inseparable from modern life. They're everywhere, in America, Europe, and some parts of Asia. While consumer demand for cell phones has grown, and as the technology has evolved to give consumers more option uh, and faster connectivity, a vigorous debate has been taking place among scientists about whether long-term use of cell phones causes tumors in the people who use them. Recently, that debate caught the public's attention with the publication in July of a warning from a preeminent oncologist about the human health effects of cell phone use. We are fortunate to have the author of that memorandum, as well as a distinguished group of individuals as witnesses before this committee today. I regret that the CTIA, the Association of the Wireless Telecommunications Industry, declined our invitation to testify. Uh, by their refusal, unfortunately, uh, they deny this Congress and the public the benefit of their testimony and the opportunity to pose questions and to hear answers. I hope that the wireless industry will reconsider their decision. Uh, should the uh, subcommittee determine it would be beneficial to hold further hearings on this matter. However, I'm grateful to the minority of the subcommittee for identifying another highly qualified expert from the National Cancer Institute. I'm confident that he will add immeasurably to the hearing. I'm proud to say that this subcommittee's partnership and spirit of cooperation with the minority is the rule rather than the exception. And I want to thank them, uh, thank Mr. Issa, for engaging in this hearing. In exploring this topic, it is my belief that the complicated scientific questions should be left to scientists. I challenge our witnesses today to answer the questions posed by members of the subcommittee clearly. 
and to challenge each other as well. In typical public debates over potential links between an environmental exposure and a health problem, convention is that the message must be black and white. On one side, the charge is made, explicit or implicit, that there is no scientific doubt about a certain health effect from the exposure of concern. On the other side, the relevant industry defends its product with the scientific assertion that there is no evidence that exposure to X causes health effect Y. Often, the reality and the science lie somewhere in between. My hope is that we can improve the public's and, the, and Congress's understanding about the gray area in this scientific debate. Today, we will let experts present the evidence, discuss the studies, describe the limitations of what is known and what can be implied from the data that we have. The question before us, then, is whether the evidence is sufficient to merit action by regulators and legislators to protect public health. What have other national government health authorities done to protect their people based on the same scientific data? What should Congress or the administration do, if anything, uh, here in the United States? Uh, at this point, I uh, want to uh, recognize and, and welcome uh, the distinguished ranking member of our subcommittee, Congressman Darrell Issa of California. Mr. Issa and I have uh, worked together uh, as partners uh, in this subcommittee uh, where we have our differences. Uh, we we uh, differ in, in a manner that is collegial, uh, but where we agree we have opportunities to uh, really uh, make uh, some profound differences. And I want to thank Mr. Issa for uh, uh, for his presentation and for his presence here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, as you said quite rightly, uh, we come from different parties and we have reached different conclusions on where government should go. But when it comes to the conclusion that science has to drive the decision process, we, we have no differences. This is an important uh, hearing today. It is important for a number of reasons. First of all, I understand it has been 15 years since the last time a hearing like this was held. Uh, secondly, as somebody who spent his career both in the military and then more extensively for 20 years in business producing radio frequency products, I am acutely aware that in fact there is a link at some point along the spectrum to cancer. Now I say that not to say that today that we will hear any conclusive evidence as to cell phones. We don't have that. And I think, quite frankly, we deserve to get it. But we do know that, for example, x-rays being used to measure shoes extensively decades ago led to a higher incidence of cancer. And in fact, today we know to limit, the va although valuable, we know to limit x-rays to that which is essential. And all our medical per personnel here would say the same thing, that uh, we don't unreasonably expose ourselves to x-rays even though we avail ourselves of the benefits. UV rays. There are many people in the, in the stands today who have suntans. If they are like me, they are natural. If, in fact, they were, they were gleaned from the sun, then you know that you do it at a significant peril that has been well documented. These rays are no different than any other rays, any other bandwidth. Uh, there is a potential for damage at some level. And in many cases, as I say, we have studied it. We know a little bit about x-rays. We know about uh, ultraviolet. It is very clear that we need to know more about the rest of the spectrum at 40 hertz, 60 hertz, at 400 megahertz, at 800 megahertz, and well into the gigahertz bands. The National Cancer Institute and the World Health Organization and the American Cancer Society claim that no link has been demonstrated to date. There may be no link. But it is also very clear that if there is a link at some level in almost, at almost any radiation, that we do need to know what is safe and unsafe. As I said, I spent more than two decades in the business of producing radio frequency products. Our company meticulously adhered to the FCC standards. Those standards were primarily designed to prevent a product from interfering with other products within the spectrum. That is a good standard and appropriate. We need to find similar good standards 
for exposure to any bandwidth of any device. And I say, I say this not to say for a moment that I know that there is a link specifically anywhere close to the amount of radiation that is going out today. But I would say that the wireless industry has played no small role in the advancement and benefit to the American people. In the last 30 years, the wireless industry has changed our lives for the better in so many ways. Today, with great re re regret, we will hear from uh, Mrs. Marks about the fact that she deals with an, uh, an impossible situation of cancer that may or may not have been caused by the extensive use of a product by, uh, I'm sorry, your son, I believe. Uh, your husband, I apologize. Uh, the, uh, and we will hear that. The, uh, the, the fact is, I don't know. I do know that you are dealing with a difficult health problem and uh, certainly one that all of us have sympathy for today. We owe it to, today to, to hear what we can hear and learn what we can learn. And, Mr. Chairman, I pledge to you that on a bipartisan basis in the next Congress, we will continue the work that we have been doing and take it to the next level of finding out what studies, what additional research we can uh, co-author in order to find out what we cannot necessarily answer here today. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I once lived under power lines, 20,000 volt power lines. I enjoyed the extra backyard. I felt no particular fear that uh, the high voltage lines were going to hurt me. Today I still don't. But many people, when I went to sell that house, enjoyed the extra backyard and were willing to pay for it. Many others looked and said, how could you live underneath these? Don't you know it causes cancer? The American people deserve their government to answer the questions about radiation at all level. I believe we have done it well in some areas. I think the testimony here today will show we have done it poorly in others. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate your indulgence, your friendship, and certainly the two years we have spent working on this committee together and yield back. I, I thank the uh, gentleman from California. Uh, I want to now introduce our panel. Uh, first, uh, to my left, Ellen Marks. Ellen Marks is a realtor and a small business owner. She is the wife of Alan Marks, who was diagnosed in May 2008 with a malignant brain tumor in his right frontal lobe. Mr. Marks could not himself be present today to testify about his personal experience with cell phones and cancer. Mrs. Marks will testify on his behalf. Julius Knapp. Julius Knapp is Chief of the uh, Federal Communication Commission's Office of Engineering and Technology. The Office of Engineering and Technology is the Commission's primary resource for engineering expertise and provides technical support to the Chairman, Commissioners, and Federal Communications Commission bureaus and officers. Mr. Knapp has responsibility within the Office of Engineering and Technology for spectrum allocations and technical rules for radio frequency devices. Previously, Mr. Knapp served as the Chief of the Policy and Rules Division where he was responsible for FCC frequency allocation proceedings and for proceedings amending the FCC rules for radio frequency devices. Mr. Knapp was Chief of the Federal Communications Commission Laboratory from 1994 to 1997, where he was responsible for the Federal Communications Commission Equipment Authorization Program. He served as Chief of Policy and Rules Division from 1997 to 2001, where he was responsible for developing the Federal Communications Commission's policies and rules for mutual recognition agreements and telecommunication certification bodies. Next, uh, Mr. Or Dr. David O. Carpenter. Dr. Carpenter is the director of the Institute for Health and Environment at the University at Albany, as well as professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. A public health physician, Dr. Carpenter previously served as the director of the Wadsworth Center for Laboratories and Research of the New York State Department of Health and later as dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Albany. 
He has over 300 peer-reviewed publications in neuroscience, toxicology, and environmental health. He has served as the co-editor of the Bio-Initiative Report, a multi-author report on animal and human effects of exposure to power line frequency and radio frequency, uh, EMFs. And Dr. Carpenter uh, earned his MS at Harvard Medical School. Next, Dr. Ronald Herberman. Dr. Herberman is the founding director of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, a National Cancer Institute designed comprehensive cancer center specializing in innovative approaches to cancer diagnosis and treatment. Along with directing UPCI, he was director of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, Cancer Centers. He also serves as chief for the Division of Hematology, Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, as well as Associate Vice Chancellor for Cancer Research at the University of Pittsburgh. Previously, Dr. Herberman was an official at the National Cancer Institute, including senior investigator in the immunology branch, section head in the laboratory of cell biology, and chief of the new laboratory of immuno immunodiagnosis. Dr. Herberman received his MD from New York University School of Medicine. He has served as president of the American Association of Cancer Institutes and serves on the editorial boards of numerous scientific journals. And finally, Dr. Robert Hoover. Dr. Hoover is director of epidemiology and biostatistics program of the Division of Cancer Epidemiology Genetics at the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Hoover earned his MD from Loyola University in Chicago and his MS and uh, SCD in epidemiology from Harvard uh, School of Public Health. Dr. Hoover serves on the editorial boards of three journals and serves on many national and international committees concerned with various aspects, ex, uh, aspects of epidemiology and preventive medicine. He has been awarded the Public Health Service Commendation Medal in 1976 the Meritorious Service Medal in 1984, and the Distinguished Service Medal in 1990. I want to thank our distinguished panelists for appearing before this subcommittee today. It is the policy of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that uh, you would all rise and raise your right hand Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have each answered in the affirmative. I would ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of your testimony and to keep that summary under five minutes in duration. I want each of you to know that uh, while your testimony uh, is, is in some cases quite extensive, uh, that you don't have to give it all at this moment, but that your entire testimony will be included in the record of this hearing so that members will have the opportunity to be able to uh, digest it. So uh, with that, what I would like to do is to start with Mrs. Marks and uh, Again, our gratitude for your presence here today. You may proceed. Thank you for inviting me to testify at this critical hearing. My name is Ellen Marks, and I live in Lafayette, California. I am here today because my beloved husband and friend of more than four decades cannot be. My husband, Alan, has a malignant brain tumor, and sadly, we suspect that it is related to his long-term cell phone exposure. As difficult as this is, for my family, I'm compelled to share our very personal story to impress upon you the dire need to legislate essential changes concerning cell phone health risks. Alan and I met when we were 15. He is a self-made man. He sold flowers in front of a cemetery at the age of 13 and then paid his own way through college and medical school. Alan became involved in the real estate industry and we moved from our native Chicago to Northern California in 1984. We are the proud parents of three adult children, ages 26, 24, and 22. 
I wish we could say that we lived happily ever after, but that is not the case. The night of May 5, 2008, we were excitingly packing to leave for our daughter's college graduation the next day. At 2 a.m., I awoke to Alan's bizarre noises and thrashing. I couldn't wake him, and the nightmare remains to this day. The worst of his seizure lasted about 25 minutes. When his eyes opened, he could not speak or understand anything asked of him by the paramedics. Witnessing a grand mal seizure is something you can never erase from your mind. Arms flail, saliva drools, eyes roll back in the head, and the face contorts. At 4 a.m. in a cold, stark emergency room, I was told that my lifelong love has a mass in his right frontal lobe, the part of the brain that allows us to differentiate between good and bad, right and wrong, control our impulses, and relate to those you love. Imagine the pain of telling our sons who had raced to the hospital in the middle of the night that their dad's increasingly irrational behavior was not a personality problem, but a lethal brain tumor. In the morning, I had no choice but to call our daughter and tell her not to pick us up at the Denver airport. Imagine her despair as she stood alone learning that her daddy could soon die. It's heartbreaking to think that he may not have that chance to walk his princess down the aisle or meet his grandchildren. Six excruciatingly long weeks later, Dr. Berger at UCSF performed a six-hour craniotomy and resection of Alan's oligodendroglioma, leaving him able to walk and talk, but personality changes remain. Titanium now holds his skull in place and the tumor will grow back. It was a slow-growing tumor which caused unexplainable, unexplainable chaos in our family for years. When you love someone and he becomes another person to act strangely, acting out against those they hold dear, you try with all your heart to find ways to help. Alan also tried with all his heart to continue to be a loving father and husband. He willingly sought professional help and took antidepressants and bipolar medications for years to no avail. He too knew something was wrong, but just not how terribly wrong. Now, as a family, we are struggling to understand that the now explainable personality changes are actually an involuntary consequence of his tumor and surgery. Not an easy task. Alan has always been a brilliant man with an incredible sense of humor and sense of responsibility to his family. He clings to that sense of resp responsibility now and is deeply depressed by his limitations. To me, he is still the most handsome man in the world, but the twinkle in his eye is gone. His cell phone and the resulting tumor have robbed us of financial security and the very pursuit of happiness. Alan, a husband, a father, and a son, has been handed a death sentence at the age of 56. Alan had his seizure and diagnosis 10 days before Senator Kennedy. Ironically, my son Zach, who is sitting behind me, interned for Senator Kennedy just a few years ago. Upon hearing a report that the senator's glioma may also be linked to cell phone use, our research began. Alan's cell phone was a vital part of his work always on, always ringing, always right next to his head. I often threatened to throw it in the garbage and how I wish I had. He had a cell phone or the original car phone for over 20 years and he averaged over 30 hours monthly. The tumor is on the same side of his head to which he held the phone. I learned there are significant flaws in many cell phone risk studies. I learned that in Scandinavia, where cell phones have been used longer than here, a 240% increased risk of glioma has been proven who those, in those who use their cell phones more than 22 hours a month. That is less than one hour daily. I learned that cell phone use is exceptionally dangerous for children. And I also learned that we are nearing an epidemic of 20 to 30 year olds who use only cell phones. If this happens, we could lose more young people to this than any war in Iran or Afghanistan. I am grateful that Dr. Herberman, a distinguished cancer scientist, has made such a courageous decision. How can we wait if, we, if waiting means sick or dead people when we have strong evidence or any evidence at all that there is a risk? What happened to my husband could happen to you or worse, 
to your children or grandchildren. I am sick and tired of hearing there is not enough conclusive evidence. My husband is conclusive evidence. I am angry as this horror could have been avoided with a simple warning. I pray that my husband's legacy will be that we help divulge the truth and that you, the leaders of our great nation, took action. Governments in other countries have taken steps to protect their citizens from this travesty. I trust you will not fail us. I beg of you not to let te technological advances invented to enrich our lives rob us of our lives instead. Please demand independent studies instead of self-serving studies funded by the cell phone industry. Please demand more rigorous safety standards. Please demand that warnings about cell phone usage and the radiation they emit be stated on every cell phone. By doing so, you will protect our most valued resource of all, human life. I love my husband with all my heart and hate what has happened to him as a result of this cancer. Please help save others from facing the deadly diagnosis and lifestyle which our family must endure, if not now, when, and if not for me, for the millions of potential victims. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Marks, for your testimony. Before I go to our next witness, I want to note that uh, we have uh, two more members of Congress who have joined us, uh, Congresswoman Diane Watson from California and Congressman uh, Higgins from New York. So I want to thank uh, the members for being here, and we certainly look forward to your participation in the uh, question and answer period. May I have just one minute? Uh, you're certainly uh, entitled to do that. It's, I haven't done this before, uh, interrupting yeah, the testimony. I, I just going. want to let the witnesses know I've experienced, Mrs. Marks, what you have. I had a niece that had two brain tumors. She grew up with a telephone on this side and one on this side. And so I just want uh, uh, all the witnesses to know that I've gone through that experience. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I thank the gentlelady. Uh, at, at this point, uh, Mr. Knapp, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman Kucinich and members of the committee. Um, very tough to, to talk after hearing that story. My heart goes out to you. Thank you. Uh, and I wish all the best for you and your family. Uh, my name is Julius Knapp. I'm the Chief of the Office of Engineering and Technology at the FCC, and I thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. Uh, as you know, the FCC is responsible for, among other things, regulating telecommunications services and devices, everything from multi-kilowatt broadcast antennas to microwatt medical implants. Pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, or NEPA, the Commission has established guidelines for human exposure to RF radiation. The FCC guidelines, which were first established in 1985, regulate the amount of RF radiation to which humans may be exposed by various transmitters regulated by the FCC. The guidelines and methods for evaluating the environmental effects of RF have been revised as scientific knowledge in the area has advanced and standard setting bodies upon which the Commission relies in setting our exposure guidelines have revised their maximum acceptable exposure criteria. The current guidelines were finalized in 1997 based on recommendations and advice of federal agencies and groups with expertise in health related areas and in standard setting. The guidelines were based primarily on criteria developed by the congressionally charted National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurement and the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers, which is within the broad umbrella of the American National Standards Institute. Uh, their adoption was supported by the Environmental Protection Agency and other health and safety agencies. Uh, four years ago, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia upheld the Commission's continued reliance on its existing rules to protect the public from potential health effects from RF exposure. The standards guidelines specify limits for human exposure to RF emissions from handheld RF devices in terms of specific absorption rate, or SAR. For exposure to the general public, 
exposure of the user of a cell phone or PCS phone, for example. The SAR limit is an absorption threshold of 1.6 watts per kilogram as measured over one gram of tissue. To ensure compliance with the RF exposure guidelines, cell phones must be certificated before they can be marketed to the public. In order to receive certification, each device must be tested to demonstrate compliance with the SAR standard. The test data and the test methodologies are reviewed before the certification was granted, and the test data, including the SAR values, are made available to the public and are on our website. In addition to establishing and enforcing the exposure limits, the FCC provides information to consumers and to industry through various publications and on our website. The FCC and the Food and Drug Administration have developed a joint website to provide health-related information for consumers who are concerned about cell phones, base station towers, and other transmitters and wireless products. Among other things, the joint website includes a link to the Commission's database of approved equipment and instructions on how to find the SAR information on individual cell phones. It also refers to outside sites that compile information on SAR for individual cell phones uh, that may be in a more readable, readily accessible format. In order to ensure the continued proprietary and efficacy of the RF emissions limits, the FCC staff continuously monitors relevant studies and literature and attends and participates in a number of groups and pertinent standards setting bodies. In addition, our staff participate with scientists from the federal health and safety agencies in an informal radio frequency interagency working group, which was chartered in 1995 to provide a coordinated federal approach to health issues. Although the Commission is responsible for setting and enforcing limits for RF exposure from devices that we authorize, it is important to understand that we rely on the guidance from U.S. health, safety, and environmental agencies in setting those limits. The FCC staff is not sufficiently qualified to speak with authority to the science of health effects of RF absorption in the bodies. Body. If agencies with expertise on health effects of RF exposure were to suggest that our standards should be modified, the Commission would initiate a rulemaking to consider changes in the standards. Uh, in closing, the Commission recognizes the public concerns about cell phone use. The science concerning health effects of RF exposure from cell phones has been the subject of great study and debate. We are continuing to monitoring, monitor the developments, and the Commission stands ready to take action if it appears appropriate to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. Dr. Carpenter, please proceed. I am very grateful for the opportunity to meet before this committee, and uh, I, I thank the Chairman, uh, Congressman Kucinich, and the other members for uh, bringing me here to tell sir, you. Sir, could you, uh, could you please bring that microphone a little bit closer? And uh, before you begin uh, further, I, I just want uh, everyone in the audience to know that we appreciate you being here, but out of respect uh, for the witnesses in this proceeding, uh, if you have a cell phone, either turn it off or put it on vibrate so that uh, the phones aren't going off in the middle of someone's testimony. You may proceed, Doctor. Thank you. I did testify before a committee of Congress about 15 years ago on the health effects of power line frequency fields. It may have been the hearing that you mentioned, although at that hearing we were not dealing with radio frequency radiation. As you mentioned in my introduction, I'm a public health physician, not a practicing medical doctor, and it's important to understand that public health is a profession that tries to prevent disease before it occurs, and it's a population-based uh, discipline. So this issue of what do we do when we have some information indicating a hazard, but when that information not be, may not be as definitive as we would like, this is a, a critical public health issue. And let me just summarize where I'm coming from on this issue in that I, I see the evidence that we have at present very strongly suggestive of there being a major risk of brain cancer and other cancers as a result of exposure to radio frequency fields. I certainly find the evidence at present to be less than 100 percent, but the public health implications under circumstances where the expansion of wireless technology 
where every child is using cell phones all of the time and when exposures are, you can't go into a McDonald's or a Starbucks without being in a wireless environment. And uh, the public health implications, if we don't take actions, and this turns out to be as bad as I suspect it is, these implications are enormous. Uh, as was mentioned, I was one of the co-editors of the Bioinitiative Report, a report that appeared about a year ago, written by an international team of four, four, 14 scientists who find that the reports from our national bodies, from the FCC, are unduly conservative in our opinion, and in doing so, fail to protect the public health. Let me summarize what I see as the most important health effects. Cell phone use really began in Europe. Cell phones were first manufactured in Scandinavia, and in Scandinavia, cell phone use was very common about 1980, long before most people in the US even knew what they were. The studies are coming out of Scandinavia showing that if you use a cell phone intensely for 10 years or more, you are at increased risk of developing a brain tumor, an acoustic neuroma, which is a benign growth of the auditory nerve, and in, in a study from Israel, cancer of the parotid gland, the salivary gland in the cheek. And these, this increased risk occurs only on the side of the head where the cell phone was used for that period of time. There are many studies of cell phone use that have not demonstrated any adverse effect. Almost without exception, these are studies that were not done for long-term users. And there is a problem with all of these studies in that the exposure assessment, that being if you were asked how frequently you used a cell phone 10 years ago, you'd have difficulty answering that question. So the research isn't perfect. Now, there are studies from Korea showing increased risks of leukemia if children simply live by an AM television, AM radio transmission tower. So that's another form of radio frequency radiation. Uh, we feel that the studies from Sweden, especially the study published in 2004 and, uh, and then uh, a more recent presentation of Dr. Leonard Hardell that occurred at a meeting in London that I attended early in, in September, showing that if a child or a young adult begins to use a cell phone early in life, their risk of going on to develop brain tumors is much higher than if an adult begins to use it. In the results presented in, in London uh, two weeks ago, uh, Dr. Hardell reported that if a, a person began to use a cell phone under the age of 20, he had a 5.2-fold elevated risk of developing a brain cancer. In contrast, if one looked at all of the people in his study, the risk was 1.4. So we call on the government to, to support research with good exposure assessment. We call on the FCC to review their standards for exposure. Their standards are presently based on the assumption, which we feel to be fallacious, that the only adverse health effect of radio frequency fields is tissue heating. And we call on the health agencies, the NIH, the EPA, the Centers for Disease Control, to issue warnings, especially to children who are more vulnerable to any environmental insult, certainly to radio frequency radiation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Carpenter. Dr. Herberman, please proceed. I want, to, <clears throat> I want to thank this committee for inviting me to talk with you today about the important concerns that have been raised about cell phones and our health. As uh, the chairman uh, nicely uh, summarized, I am a physician and cancer researcher and the founding director of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, uh, UPCI. I'm here with you today to discuss my reasons for being concerned about the potential for health effects from cell phones that led me to uh, develop a simple precautionary message to reduce exposure now while we develop new research to better measure the possible health impacts of cell phone and cordless phone use. A little bit about the UPCI. It's ranked by the National Cancer Institute, uh, NCI, among the top 10 cancer research centers based on cancer research funding 
For two decades before coming to Pittsburgh, I worked for the NCI with teams of innovative researchers. I have published more than 700 peer-reviewed uh, articles. Although I am a physician scientist, I need to point out that I am not, as Dr. Carpenter is, an expert on cell phones and cancer risk. As history tells us, there are examples where delays in reducing exposure to cancer-causing substances have led to large increases in cancer. Tobacco use is one striking example. Mindful of lessons learned, the UPCI's Center for Environmental Oncology began a process more than a year ago of reviewing evidence on the possible association of brain cancer with the long-term use of cell phones. During this process, I became aware of a growing body of scientific evidence indicating that long-term frequent use of cell phones which receive and emit radio frequency RF signals may be associated with an increased risk of brain tumors, including malignant gliomas, the type of uh, tumor that Senator Kennedy recently developed, as well as uh, Dr. Marx. This particularly concerned me since in the United States today, more than nine out of every 10 adults uses a cell phone, a remarkable number that has doubled in just the past five years. Worldwide, there are three billion regular cell phone users, including a growing number of children. Generally speaking, it is important to stress that children are not just little adults. They often uh, are much more vulnerable to the effects of environmental exposures. For cell phones, this matters because the skull of children is much less dense than the skull of adults and modeling research has shown that cell phone RF signals are absorbed much deeper into the brains of children. In contrast to the United States, as Dr. Carpenter has pointed out, in the Scandinavian countries, widespread cell phone use has been prevalent for more than two decades. Dr. Leonard Hardell, a, a, a distinguished oncologist, finds that people who have used cell phones the most have double the chance of developing malignant brain tumors and also tumors on the hearing nerve called acoustic neuromas. Dr. Hardell has also, as Dr. Carpenter just summarized, recently reported that teenagers who use cell phones have five times more brain tumors by the age of 29. I recognize that many studies do not show any association, but most of these negative studies have followed people for a relatively short period of time. It seems likely that brain cancer can take 10 or more years to develop. In addition, few studies have controlled for cordless phone use and uh, these cordless phones also release RF signals. In population-based research, clearly methods always matter. My concerns about the use, uh, about the risk for developing brain tumors from long-term cell phone use, and my particular concern about risks for children, coupled with the knowledge that experts in several other countries had issued precautionary uh, advisories, led me to uh, uh, issue an, advi an advisory in July to our physicians, scientists, and staff. The advice was straightforward and has been widely shared by colleagues and uh, news outlets around the world. Within a week of the distribution of uh, the precautionary memo to our staff, the Israeli Health Ministry endorsed our recommendations. Our warning has also been translated into German, Portuguese, and Spanish. Our advisory recommends that you use cell phones, but carefully. Don't keep them turned on and on your body all the time. Use an earpiece, a headset, or a speakerphone no, mode. Based on the current body of evidence, as a physician scientist who has devoted my life to preventing cancer and saving lives, I cannot tell this committee that cell phones are definitely dangerous, but I certainly cannot tell you that they are safe. How are we going to resolve this important matter? Should we simply wait and watch, or should we take simple precautions while we undertake additional, more definitive research that will tell the whole story? I urge this committee 
to work collaboratively with the cell phone industry so that independent researchers at our institution, MD Anderson Cancer Institute, and the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences will be better able to produce the best, most accurate study of cell phone use and health effects. The future of our children and grandchildren, I believe, demands that we work together to understand the potential risks from cell phones and, if necessary, to develop effective solutions to reduce uh, future health uh, threats. And in closing, I would just uh, uh, say that I find the old adage uh, uh, to be better safe than sorry to be very apt for this situation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Huberman. I, I want to uh, note that Congressman Burton uh, from Indiana is, is with us, and uh, in, a, in a previous Congress, he was chairman of the full committee. So I appreciate uh, Mr. Burton's presence here. Uh, Dr. Hoover, you may proceed. And then after Dr. Hoover, we are going to uh, go to questions of the witnesses. Thank you very much. Make sure that Dr. Hoover's microphone is on. You want to test that? Oh, all right. Uh, I'm Bob Hoover. I'm the uh, director of the Epidemiology and Biostatistics Program at the National Cancer Institute, and I'll be talking briefly about the scientific evidence on the topic of cell phones and risk of brain cancer. While as an epidemiologist, I'll be focusing today on studies of risk in human populations, it is also important to note that on the biologic side, radio frequency radiation from cell phones is billions of times lower than the energy of, of X-ray photons. As such, its effect on the body, at least at this time, appears to be insufficient to produce genetic damage typically associated with developing cancer. Alternative mechanisms have been suggested, but to date, uh, we, these all, no alternative mechanism of how this exposure might co result in cancer has been vetted adequately. F from the epidemiologic side, descriptive data from the large network of population-based tumor registries funded by the National Cancer Institute reveal that there has been no increase in the incidence of brain or other, other nervous system cancers from 1987 through 2005, a time period when cell phone use increased by about tenfold. From the analytic side, the earliest analytic epidemiologic studies, including one conducted by the National Cancer Institute, self-reported frequency and patterns of cell phone use were compared between patients diagnosed with brain or nervous system tumors, known as cases, and patients or controls with other diseases, an investigation known as a case control study. These studies found no convincing evidence of an association between cell phone use in glioma, a malignant tumor of the brain, or from an angioma or acoustic neuroma to largely benign tumors of the nervous system. These early studies pointed out that future investigators, investigations would be needed to evaluate potential effective long-term use as well as changing cell phone technology. As a result, a new generation of cell phone studies is emerging. However, brain cancer is a very difficult disease to study well epidemiologically. Much of the disease is rapidly fatal and the tumor in its treatment can impair cognitive function. Cases may cooperate at different rates than controls, and answers to questions may be altered in someone who knows they have a specific condition. Given all of this, it is not surprising that there is a fair amount of inconsistency within and between many of these studies, both in quality and in findings. Because of this, I'll focus only on the larger and better designed of these studies. Perhaps the most notable of these is a large collaborative project that includes individual studies from 13 countries, collectively known as Interphone. Analyses of data from individual centers and those pooled from some but not all of the individual countries have been published. These individual studies have found no evidence of an overall increase in the risk of any type of brain tumors associated with the first 10 years of cell phone use. In addition, no increased risk has been found in relation to several measures of exposure, including time since first use, lifelong, lifetime years of use, the number of calls, the hours of use, and the use of analog versus digital phones. A somewhat, a somewhat increased risk has been found in some studies for tumors diagnosed on the same side of the head the cell phone was used for those with more than 10 years of cell phone use. But these are based on small numbers, generally less than 5 percent of the cases under study, and are not consistently seen across all the studies. 
Many of us are hopeful that the combined interphone analysis, including all the centers in the original study, which is now underway, will provide a much larger number of long-term users, which will allow an evaluation of different exposure metrics and latency, a formal assessment of the consistency in study-specific results, and more comprehensive and statistically stable estimates. This could bring some clarity to the current state of the science. In another noteworthy study, Danish investigators followed up cell phone subscribers over time and found no increased risk of brain tumors among the subscribers. This type of study, called a prospective study, has the advantage of not having to rely on people's ability to remember their past cell phone use, which could be inaccurate or biased. We do know that cell phone use is increasing rapidly among children and adolescents. There are they are a potentially sensitive group because of their small head size and could result in higher radio frequency exposure, and the unbrain may be more sensitive. To date, there are no published studies in the peer review literature regarding the risk of cancer and cell phone use in children. However, there are ongoing studies in Europe that will soon provide information on the risk from cell phone use among children. In summary, then, thus far, brain cancer incidence trends in the U.S. are unrelated to patterns of cell phone use. Most analytic studies indicate no overall increased risk of brain tumors within the, within the first 10 years. There are inconsistent findings of increased risk across many different ways of measuring increased dose. There are some isolated findings of increased risk in some dose and population subgroups, but larger studies and replication in different study designs are needed to sort out the roles of chance and bias from those findings that are really worth pursuing. Potential risks associated with childhood exposure have not been assessed. Insight into these last two points may come relatively soon from ongoing analyses of the overall interphone study and from the Northern European Case Control Study of Childhood Cancer. I thank you for the opportunity to present and look forward to your questions. I uh, thank you, Dr. Hoover. I want to thank each of the witnesses. We're going to go to questions from members. I would like to begin. Uh, by asking the uh, scientists that, who are here, uh, I believe every one of you agrees that the science is not conclusive on a connection between cell phones and human health effects. Nevertheless, some scientists look at inconclusive data and see something of concern, while others look at that uh, same data and conclude there's no connection. For the layperson, can you scientists please explain how is that possible? Dr. Carpenter, you want to start? Well, I wear both hats. I'm also a laboratory scientist. And the tradition in laboratory science is that one uh, keeps doing experiments until you get results that show a consistency where there's no greater than a 5% chance that your result could be due to statistical variability. Uh, as a public health official, I look at this issue quite differently because I agree that I don't think that the overall evidence for brain cancer from using cell phones reaches quite that 95 percent confidence limit. But as a public health official, uh, are we at the same place we were with smoking and lung cancer 30 years ago? In fact, as uh, Dr. Davis in a recent book uh, demonstrated very clearly, the Nazis in the 30s had definitive evidence for a relationship between smoking and lung cancer. We in the U.S. ignored that evidence and did nothing until the Surgeon General's report in, what, the late 70s? And I see this from the public health perspective as being very, very important that we urgently need more research. I, I totally agree with Dr. Hoover. I think this interphone study uh, has some potential, but there's some problems with that as well. We have almost no U.S. funded research in this area. D Dr. Herberman, would you uh, care to respond? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, there are several uh, issues that I'd like to bring up. One is, although there have been a number of different studies, I'd point out that uh, the large majority of the negative studies are actually not independent of each other, but have used the same uh, methods. Uh, what, does that, what does that mean? Uh, well, particularly uh, about six different uh, countries that participated uh, in the Interphone study 
uh, used exactly the same design. So uh, if there are flaws in the design, these would be replicated across uh, each of those studies. One of those uh, which is often cited, the uh, Danish Cancer Society study, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Hoover referred to that, uh, used a very large number of people, but it excluded uh, all business users from the study. Uh, that uh, study actually started with uh, about 700,000 cell phone users, but excluded the uh, 200,000 who were the business users, and most likely during that era, the most heavy uh, users of cell phones. They also defined a user as someone who made a simple one call a week. That's not the type of exposure that uh, I'm concerned about. Uh, they also didn't evaluate, uh, in most of these studies, the use of cordless phones, which, as I said in my testimony, also involves uh, radio frequency uh, signals. Uh, lastly, let me try to uh, address uh, the, uh, some of the comments that Dr. Uh, Hoover uh, just made. As he nicely summarized, most of the studies that look at the data mainly uh, looked at exposures of less than 10 years. But as I said in my testimony, I believe it's most likely that the latent period uh, before cancer would develop from such exposure would be probably more than 10 years. I also note that Dr. Uh, Hoover uh, failed to uh, uh, discuss the, uh, uh, the studies by uh, Dr. Leonard Hardell. And uh, I noticed in the cancer bulletin that the NCI just published within the last few days that among their references, the uh, Hardell studies were omitted. I think that this is a major uh, lapse uh, of turning a blind eye to the studies that concern me the most. I, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Huberman. I'm gonna, we're going to have a chance to get back to you and to uh, Dr. Hoover, excuse me, uh, when I ask uh, the next round of questions to the witnesses. But before my time is up, I want to ask Mrs. Marks if you have any response to what you've just heard. And, and I would just ask you to just keep it brief. Well, my response would be that I, I'm not a scientist. I'm a human being, a mother, a wife. Um, I do know from my research and from talking with um, doctors and scientists worldwide that there are major flaws even in this interphone study. I have in front of me something right here that says the interphone studies always find a statistical significant <laughs> elevated risk when a cell phone has been used for 10 or more years on the same side of the head where the tumor was found. I'm sorry, but I'm not understanding the lack of correlation here. Okay, we're, I, we're, uh, you know what, I'm going to, in, in deference to uh, Dr. Hoover, who may have a, a different opinion, uh, I'll give you a brief response to what was said here. Okay, you want me to respond to that you rather can than your to question? Your, to, uh, to your colleagues here. Okay, yeah. Um, certainly, Dr. Hardell's studies, uh, Dr. Hardell has made important contributions and he was one of the first in the field. As I mentioned in my uh, statement, however, that uh, as more studies have come out, there's the capability and more diverse findings have emerged, there's a capability of, of segregating. Uh, studies by quality, and uh, I, one of the I think, to uh, Dr. Hardell's credit, he tr attempted to do something very fast, and yet an answer very quickly. Uh, he used a method of using of pursuing prevalent cases in his early studies that effectively ended up eliminating everybody who died quickly or had significant impairment, and then I think his first study had about less than 30 percent of the total number of cases. So there have been, uh, over time, studies to address those kinds of issues and, I've basic, and also have, have more long-term users. So I, I certainly uh, uh, focused on, uh, mainly on those. Uh, any comprehend, we could have a discussion all day about uh, uh, Well, we're, we're, we're definitely going to go to more questions. Right. Uh, and uh, um, so I think that uh, the, the issue of, of the metric and the dose is that I, I think tobacco was mentioned a couple of times. Uh, you know, with tobacco and with ionizing radiation, for example, there are uh, there are associations with virtually any dose measure you use with um, with 
uh, dose rate, how many cigarettes per day, with total duration that you smoked, with total pack years, kind of with age that you started, with time since you stopped. Uh, those are all, so it make it in with those kind of data, it makes it really easy to to think, think there's really something going on thus far. I, I want to I thank the gentleman. I, I have, uh, unfortunately, my time to ask questions has expired a couple minutes ago. We're going to go to Mr. Burton, and then we're uh, going to have, after uh, Ms. Watson, we're going to go to the, another round of questioning. You'll have more of an opportunity to uh, expand on that. Chair recognizing Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Three billion users worldwide, you're not going to put this genie back in the bottle. It's a problem that uh, is not going to go away if it is a problem. Uh, what I would like to know, first of all, is are there any uh, uh, scientific or is there any scientific research going on now that would uh, uh, allow cell phones that, but not used in the proximity uh, that they are right now. You, I think one of you said that this this little piece that I put on my ear, uh, that it uh, it would be much safer. Doesn't it have radio waves connected to it at all? Any of the any of the yeah, witnesses I mean, does, may does, respond. Does, does an ear FCC. ear uh, receptacle <laughs> like this does it have uh, uh, radio waves? Yes. yes. Uh, there it is. So so the uh, risk. Yeah, yes. Yes. It does. So it, the risk is still there. It. If I can just add, it's about one twentieth of the power from a normal cell phone. Well, then phone. I'm going to be using that a lot more. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, uh, you, you mentioned that it, it would could cause brain tumors, ear tumors. I presume the jaw and anything that's in close proximity would be at risk for some kind of cancer. What about if you carry it in your pocket? You know, men and women uh, carry these things around in their pockets. They don't have them sticking out in the air someplace. What about other forms of cancer that might be caused? And I, was, I know you're speculating. I'd just like to know uh, what you think about that. If I could answer that. The cancer that we see with power line frequencies that's been seen with radio frequency fields in Korea from AM radio transmitters is leukemia. Uh, there is one report of an increase in prostate cancer in men that wear their cell phone in their belt. My suspicion, I think it needs much more study, is that leukemia is the most vulnerable cancer, that beyond that, if you have a localized exposure, as you do with the use of a cell phone at the ear, you get cancer of the organs around there. If you wear it in your belt, you're radiating your pelvis. So uh, again, we need more research, but I think this is more likely to be a general well, carcinogen. Yeah, ass assuming, assuming that your thesis is correct, what can we do about this? Well, what other, I mean, people are going to want to communicate because they're used to it now and they like carrying it around. They like to be able to get a hold of their husband or their wife or their kids in a moment's notice and know where they are and talk to them about issues that are important to them. So I don't think this is going to change. So what can be done to make these things safer if that is the problem? Well, I, I agree. I don't think we're going to go back to the pre-wireless age and I wouldn't even advocate that. And I think it really depends on a combination of industry finding ways to manufacture products that don't have as much radiation, plus government finding ways of lowering the exposure limits that are considered well, acceptable. Any, uh, to your knowledge, any of your knowledge, are any companies doing research on, on uh, home, home phones? Everybody's got a phone they're carrying around their home as well. On home phones, as far as radiation is concerned, and the cell phones, are any companies that, to your knowledge, working on or doing research to find out if they can cut down the amount of uh, uh, radio waves that are that are emanating from these things? Anybody? Does anybody know? If you don't know, just tell me. I, I believe that uh, some of the industry companies, in particular Motorola, has done research along the way. Whether it's focused on reducing the power, that I don't know. Okay, kids are sitting in front of, and this is a different subject, but I think it is relative to talk about it, it's related. Uh, kids sit in front of computers all the time. I mean, they're constantly there, either studying or, or playing games. I mean, they're watching that, many of them, most kids I think today, the younger ones, are using those more than they're using uh, watching television even. So this exposure from a computer, does that emit radio waves and is that a, a threat as well? Well, if I can answer that, 
If it's a wireless computer, yes. If it's wired, uh, there is a little bit of radio frequency radiation in any computer screen, any television screen, but there's not significant exposure. So uh, wired devices, a wired telephone, uh, is not going to release any radio frequency radiation. Most computers are not going to unless they're in a wireless mode. Okay, I'm about out of time. Uh, the phones that we have at home, the phones that we have at home, everybody's got a mobile phone they're carrying around their house. My wife loses it all the time and I hope she's watching. Uh, do they emit as much radiation as the cell phones? Uh, generally not. Uh, and the reason for that is your home phone is only trying to go maybe 100 feet or so as opposed to your cell phone that has to get back to a tower that might be a mile and a half away. So it's generally much less. I think I've run out of time, but you're, you're telling me that, that this little device, if we use it and if we keep the, the cell phone away from vital organs in the body, we, we reduce our risk, according to you, uh, fairly dramatically. Okay. Can I make one comment, please? Sure, sure. What we have all purchased since this happened with my husband are earbuds with a little microphone. They're $10 and plug into your cell phone. Remarkably, my husband stopped using his cell phone to his ear upon the diagnosis. And at his first MRI, his tumor had not grown as aggressively as the doctors had suspected. So one thing we might want to consider, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, is buy some earbuds and plug it into your phone. I think that could help tremendously. I hope the scientists agree with me. Well, can I ask one more question? If, if people, I carry these things in my pocket all the time, and I don't want to get prostate cancer or anything else. I don't think anybody else does. Uh, is there any kind of a device that's around that would, uh, would uh, like a lead device or something that you could put around these things that would, uh, would keep them from emitting? I mean, people are going to ask these questions that would keep them from emitting the kind of ways that might endanger people. And I see Dr. Hoover's squirming all over the place with this thing, but I'd just like to know from your, your perspective. I was given a little uh, woven net that uh, at this meeting in London two weeks ago that really does prevent the, uh, the radiation from, from getting out. Now, I don't know how practical that is in terms of if you're carrying it in your pocket, you want to be able to receive a call if it comes in. But uh, there are some what devices. Is that, what is that substance? That, what's that thing made out of? I'm not sure what it's made of, but it's just a little woven pocket that you slip. And it uh, cuts down the, uh, the amount of radiation. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The uh, chair recognizes uh, Congresswoman from California, Congresswoman Watson. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman, for holding this hearing. As I mentioned up front, uh, I've experienced that not only in my own family, but with several of my friends. I think many of you know of the late Johnny Cochran, and there's a lot of concern about what brought on his tumors and caused his death. But uh, when I came in, Mrs. Marks, you were speaking. What kind of work did your husband do? My husband went to medical school, and then he switched careers. He is a real estate developer and broker. I see. And used to be involved in the financial end of And so real he uh, had that phone at his ear 24-7, I would imagine. He did. Yeah. Yes. It was uh, a vital part of his work. I, you know, I've been doing a visual study myself because of my 39-year-old uh, niece. Uh, she had uh, a tumor, cancerous tumor, on her left ear first. It was removed. And three years later, it appeared again on the right side. And I was told by the doctor that the cancer stayed under a flap in her cranium. So I just want to say, uh, if the cancer is in the body and the cells can remain there, and uh, he said that it just went elsewhere and appeared again. Um, Mr. Knapp, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that uh, as the FCC is a primary regulator of cell phones, the agency gets its information about evolving science around cell phones and tumors or other health effects from other agencies, primarily from the FDA. Uh, do you know if there's any staff person who has a background in health or biological 
sciences, any expertise there at, at the FCC? At the FCC. Uh, not in the area of analyzing biological data or medical science. Mm. Uh, our, our focus has, is on the implementation. So once the standard is in place, we have the engineers who can make sure that the products comply with the standards. Mm -hmm. Well, how often does the FDA discuss uh, information with the FCC on science uh, of health effects and your research and how does this exchange occur? Do they communicate and coordinate? Yeah, it, it happens at many levels. Uh, staff from FDA and FCC both participate in some of the standard setting organizations that deal in this field. There's an interagency working group that includes FDA, EPA, OSHA, all the agencies involved in this that communicates uh, about four times a year. And then we also have informal staff to staff meetings to discuss broad topics of interest between our agencies, radio devices, including any changes on RF exposure that uh, meets two to two, two to three times a year. So they do share with you information. Absolutely. If so, uh, does the FCC issue new rules pertaining to the cell phones and how would the agency be able to deliberate upon public comments pertaining to health effects? I mean, I'm sure they get lots of calls. You know, it, what happens as a result of obtaining this information? It, t typically what happens, we'll participate in these meetings and ask for advice from those health agencies as to is there something we should be doing? Should we, we have a standard that's adopted, should it be changed? And uh, thus far we haven't gotten guidance to, to change that from the other agencies. As far as were we to be in the position of trying to evaluate that, we really don't have the expertise to tell which level causes which effects and which studies are, are valid on the medical side. I think I heard somewhere on the panel that some countries are issuing uh, warnings. Does anyone on the panel know what countries and what kind of warnings they are issuing? Yes, I'd be happy to speak to that. <clears throat> Before I issued my advisory back in no, late July, uh, several countries in Europe had uh, put out uh, <laughs> such precautionary advisories. They were specifically uh, Germany, France, and Sweden, and also uh, the province of Ontario. And after uh, my advisory was uh, issued, uh, the government of Israel also uh, came out uh, uh, with uh, parallel recommendations. I'd also, if uh, I could just take another minute, uh, like to address one point about what you're raising about the FCC uh, regulations. Uh, Mr. Knapp has referred specifically to the SARs, which are uh, helpful indications of uh, the amount of absorption that occurs from the radio frequency into the brain. I'd point out that uh, <clears throat> these are based on adults. And uh, as I said in my testimony, there is uh, quite striking evidence that uh, if you do the same type of absorption studies in children, the amount of absorption into the brain is considerably greater. I actually brought a uh, visual model to uh, demonstrate what Professor Gandhi, who did uh, studies along these lines, has actually shown. And his studies have been confirmed by French Telecom. Mr. Chairman, can we have a little more time to see these models? We're yep. going to go to another. Um, Th this would just uh, take one, uh, just a couple sure, of seconds. Of course. Yeah, we, we're, we're going to go to another level of qu uh, questioning, but please proceed. If I could just show, this is the, uh, a model of the brain that shows the amount of absorption into the brain of an adult. It only goes about two inches into the brain. This is a model of the same part of the brain near the ear of a five-year-old child. This goes pretty far into the brain. And I think uh, that's something that the FCC should consider to talk about the amount of absorption into the brains of children as opposed to adults. 
Uh, could staff bring could staff bring that model up here for a minute? Can we get pictures of that? Is there any way to get? Yeah. I saw some pictures. Some would, would staff uh, bring the model up here? I just want to take a look at it. Um, the gentlelady's time has expired on, on this round. Uh, we're going to come back. Uh, we're going to take another round here. Can I make an inquiry? Uh, let, let me just make an inquiry. I, I don't know whether it's possible, but uh, could, is there any way with our copying devices to make copies of that so we can take those with us? Don't drop it. Uh, actually, within my written testimony, we have a photograph uh, showing okay, the I, same Okay, I just thing. want to, just for the record uh, here, uh, this uh, this model, uh, Dr. Herberman, uh, is you know an adult brain model. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And then where uh, where does the on this model where's the uh, cell phone? Uh, the thing sticking out on the side is supposed the cardboard thing is the in cell here. phone is right here. Right there. Okay, so the cell phone is here, and the what you're saying is that uh, and this actually you know so we're trying to keep this uh, close to the model. The cell phone is here, and you're saying that the uh, directed energy from that cell phone goes in like this and then expands outward into, into, the, into the tissue of the brain. Yeah, and this now, shows... So in just turning it uh, in another view, uh, that's when an adult brain... Now, what's your basis for that? Uh, are there... Uh, there are studies that prove this. Is that what you're saying? This was done uh, with uh, models in which uh, radio frequency signals that are uh, in the same uh, range as uh, uh, the commonly used cell phones Can, were okay, used now, for this. Now, this would be a model of a child's brain at what age? Five years old. Five-year-old child. Uh, fi do you have research that shows or uh, public health uh, research, uh, Dr. Carpenter, that five-year-old children will use a cell phone? Is that possible? I've had inquiries from parents of two-year-old children who give them their child the on cell phone to play with. Uh, I don't think most five-year-olds are making phone calls, but when kids get in elementary school, okay, then so, they begin. So, okay, now here we've seen, you know, we've seen the effect. Here's the uh, adult uh, brain effect of use of the cell phone. And then we look at the child again. Um, so the cell phone is here, is that right? Correct. Cell phone's here, and it's a very deep penetration, you're saying. Now, is this kind of penetration of the energy of a cell phone, the radio frequencies, radiation, we're saying, um, would you say that from, from looking at this visually, is it your testimony that most of the brain of a child would be, uh, would receive uh, s some of this energy? That's correct. Most of the brain, at least on that side of the head, uh, would be uh, absorbing uh, that energy. And it's a simple explanation for it. Uh, one is that the skull is considerably thinner in a, in a child, and it doesn't uh, reach maturity until uh, the 20s. In addition to that, the nerves in the brain uh, in adult are, uh, are protected by a myelin sheath. In uh, children, the myelin uh, has not fully developed, so there's several reasons for the increased absorption in a child. Well, let's, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, children here. Uh, you're saying that children are more vulnerable, just no question about it. I mean, the, the, you presented models here which demonstrate that. You say there's research that back that up. And uh, when you, and we've, this is a f model of a five-year-old. Now, are children 10 years old vulnerable? This was actually done as part of the same modeling experiment. And as uh, you might guess, uh, the uh, model of the brain of a 10-year-old is somewhere in between that of a 5-year-old and an adult. Children, are they 15, children 15 years old? There's two, we're talking teenagers here. Are they young teenagers, do they have a vulnerability? Is it your testimony they have a vulnerability? I believe they still are more vulnerable than adults. You believe or you know, because doctor? Because of the myelin. Doctor, you believe or you know? What, what uh, do you? This has not been uh, directly studied, but I think uh, from other biologic information, I know 
that there is not as much myelin protection to a teenager as there is for an adult? Uh, one of the things that, that occurs to me, and my colleagues I think would probably support this, it is customary in our society to look at various products or substances and say that children should not be uh, permitted to have access to them or to use them. For example, states have passed laws that uh, restrict children from being able to purchase cigarettes. States have laws that restrict children from being able to purchase alcohol. Uh, we even have uh, national standards that restrict children's access to being able to watch certain types of movies. Um, should there be, uh, in, and I'd like to have a response from uh, uh, the doctors who are here, is it, is it your judgment that as a precautionary measure uh, there should be uh, national standards uh, of either warning or precaution of, uh, uh, of relating to the use of cell phones uh, for children ages um, uh, of any age. Uh, Dr. Carpenter. I would certainly support warnings and precautionary levels. I wouldn't say that the evidence is so overwhelming that absolutely prohibiting them I do have Dr. Hardell's slide that he presented two weeks ago showing that the risk for people under the age of 20 when they start to use their cell phone is increased by 5.2 fold, whereas for the overall population including that group, there was only a 1.4 percent increase in risk. I think the evidence is, is certainly strong enough for warnings that children should not use cell phones. So you, you would recommend that we would take uh, strong preventive action now based on evidence at hand? Absolutely, because Dr. I Herberman. think failure to do that is going to lead us to an epidemic of brain cancer in the future. Dr. Herberman, would you respond? Yes, at uh, a couple of levels. One is I think the uh, statements from the, uh, the wireless phone industry when they sell cell phones should include the data about the specific absorption uh, rates for children as well as adults so that people will be better informed about this issue. And secondly, that is why as one of the precautions that I've advised and several other countries have advised is to uh, warn uh, that children, particularly young children, should limit their uh, cell phone use. Dr. Hoover, do you have a response? I'm, I think it does depend on whether there's a risk or not, and I, I think What depends on if there's a risk? Pardon me? What depends if there's a risk? Whether you would make a recommendation or not, and uh, I, um, I have not had the opportunity to see Hardell, Dr. Hardell's study, but presumably it will be in the peer-reviewed literature soon and I can take a look at it. Um, and there is, a, I think, a very good study uh, on the, that's been concluded uh, its field phase this December and probably will have uh, data in uh, the early 09 or mid 09, which should really get, go a long way towards telling us if there is a risk among children. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoover. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, once again uh, Mr. Burton of Indiana. You know, when I, uh, when I look at these models, these brains, uh, how, how did they how, how did they come up with this? How did you decide how far the radiation was going in? I mean, you obviously didn't cut somebody's brain open. How how how, do, how, do, how can you tell that the danger is this severe with a child, and how severe it is with an adult? Well, <clears throat> this was not actually done with brains. Uh, this, as described in the uh, publication by Professor Gandhi, uh, and the uh, reference for that is in. Uh, the appendix to my written testimony was making a model of what is known about the, uh, the, the, the uh, thickness of the skull and other characteristics of the brain of a child compared to uh, an adult and then using uh, radio frequency signals that uh, mimic uh, the uh, 
type of radiation than one gets uh, to the ear by holding a cell phone to the ear. So it's modeling data rather than actual uh, human or brain data, but uh, uh, it's not only been done by Professor Gandhi, but as I said, uh, French Telecom came out with a study recently that confirmed uh, Professor Gandhi's results, so I believe it's uh, quite credible. Well, I, I, I'm not disputing that at all, uh, but when you start talking about putting warning labels on uh, on products, and I'm, I think you're probably correct, so, but I'm playing devil's advocate here. Uh, Shouldn't you do some tests on possibly animals by putting some kind of a device similar to a, 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 a cellular phone near their ear and, 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 and watch the result of that? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I still don't, don't understand how you can be really accurate from just a, a, a model without ha actually seeing the effect on a living uh, organism. I can't specifically respond to this, but maybe uh, Dr. Carpenter can. Well, in this, I have this publication here. What, what they did was construct uh, model brains of the composition that you'd have of, of these different ages, and then put probes in to measure the penetration of the radio frequency fields. Now, unfortunately, those probes are not, they're not small, so actually putting them into, right. say, a monkey brain would be technically complicated, but I, I basically do agree with you that it would be much better to have real measurements in a living brain. Well, is, is, is there anything in the human skull or brain that, w that is, is substantially different than the test model? The reason I'm asking that is because the test model may show these things, and is it conclusive that the human brain will have the same reaction? There certainly is always the possibility that your model is not accurate. I, I acknowledge that. But it, uh, this, was, this was done to the best of the understanding of the electrical characteristics of the skull and the brain tissue uh, by Dr. Gandhi, who's in the, uh, uh, he's a member of the IEEE, so he is uh, uh, an expert in these in the physical properties of these fields. So there's no doubt that the radio waves are penetrating. Whether or not this is ex entirely accurate is, it may, may be questionable, but, but there's no question that the radio waves uh, are going into the brain and could uh, cause uh, tumors. And that's precisely how I see that result. Now, one more thing. I was asking about us carrying these phones around, and I carry two phones and a computer. <laughs> Scares the dickens out of me. Uh, but when you carry those in your pocket, uh, what evidence is there that, that, that the radio waves will, will penetrate far enough to get to your vital organs? They're not on the surface. If I could address that, uh, there's not a lot of data about this, but uh, I have been struck by two reports uh, that uh, uh, I think are relevant. Uh, one was a study uh, from the Cleveland Clinic uh, that reported that uh, men who carried cell phones around in their pocket uh, had lower sperm counts. Uh, uh, and uh, another report uh, indicated that by taking bone marrow from the hip on the side where the cell phone is kept in the pocket had uh, lower uh, uh, bone marrow uh, uh, counts uh, for generating uh, blood forming uh, cells. Uh, uh, so I think this is uh, suggestive evidence, but more needs to be done to be certain about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I make a comment as a parent about sure. the children please, issue? Please proceed. Um, there was a report in our local newspaper recently that on opening day of school that between 80 to 90 percent of the children in elementary school came back to school with cell phones. I have also heard from Lloyd, Dave, Lloyd Morgan, who is a scientist and was recently in London at the conference that Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Hardell were at, that children are sleeping with, or and teenagers, with their cell phones on underneath their pillows. I can't imagine that that would not be a risk, considering what I've heard today. I also called AT&T for my husband's cell phone records. 
And while I was on hold, AT&T has a recorded message playing. And one of the things that they say is, please limit the amount of time that your child uses a cell phone. I'd like to know why they are saying that. Uh, I thank the uh, gentlelady for her additional comments. And the chair recognizes um, Ms. Watson. You know, you've given us such food for thought, and just through my observation, I'm seeing that uh, we suffer under a great deal of risk, given the kinds of uh, radiation uh, contributing devices we have in our homes and around our children. And that flesh that seems to be absorbent, so absorbent when you're young, is exposed to it 24-7 in every room in their homes. And um, this is a question, and whoever might address it, I'd appreciate it. Can the use of high-frequency wireless network routers in the home be a potential health hazard as well? Um, the, the FCC also authorizes those kinds of devices. Uh, the power levels, again, are generally much lower. We do look at them to make sure that they're going to either comply with the SAR standard or an RF exposure risk. Uh, generally, the, the, there are two things that uh, reduce any risk from those kind of products, the lower power level and the separation. So we don't have those products up against our bodies. Um, I note that in a lot of businesses now, they have a screen they're putting, uh, separating the uh, human from the uh, screen on the computer. Uh, do you know those screens they're putting in front of the television screen, any of you? Um, I'm not sure exactly which screens you mean, but the, the old picture tubes the picture tubes, you, and then there's a screen they're using. Yeah, they, but, but the screens that are used today, the LCD screens and the plasmas generally don't pose a, a risk that I'm aware of. They don't use the kind of radiation that the old big picture tubes did. The old ones yes. do. Yes. New technology is reducing the risk. Mm hmm Thank you very much. Huh? I yield back. I thank, I thank the gentlelady. Uh, what are the trends in brain cancer rates for young adults and children? Dr. Hoover? Dr. Hoover, you want to, you do you know that, do you have information yeah, about the, that? Um, the, the rates in children went up a little bit in going from the 70, 1970s to the 1980s. From when? from the 1970s to the 1980s. And then, uh, as for the total rate, have been pretty level from the late 80s till, till currently, or till 2005, which is our recent data. Dr. Herberman. Yes, we've been looking at this issue uh, and uh, are, in fact, preparing a publication uh, related to this. Uh, Could you bring that microphone a little bit closer? Yes. we're. Uh, actually uh, carefully looking at the studies uh, from the SEER registry that the NCI and the CDC uh, maintain. And uh, what I've been struck by is uh, uh, an increased rate uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, particularly uh, for individuals in the age range between uh, 20 and 29. And this would fit, perhaps, with the Hardell data that uh, Dr. Carpenter was alluding to, uh, and again, is of concern. Is, uh, I can, is I can the latency period for uh, brain cancers longer then? Is there a latency period of, of the cancer involved here? Well, we can't really be certain, but uh, based on uh, general experience with tumors of this type and others, uh, I'm estimating that uh, a latent period of uh, 10 years or more is a very likely uh, uh, thing, but uh, we need more evidence about that. Well, if brain, if brain cancer was associated uh, or is associated with cell phones, when would this exposure become evident in the human population? Well, if it takes more than 10 years, 
Would you would you speak closer to that microphone? Uh, with the, if it takes indeed more than ten years, as uh, I'm surmising, uh, then uh, it would probably be another uh, five years or more in the United States at least before we would see the uh, the effects of the almost ubiquitous use now of uh, cell phones. Uh, Dr. Carpenter, would you like to respond? I, I was just saying that, that I could. So I, excuse me. I could certainly provide. Dr. Hoover. You. Yes. I directed a question to Dr. Carpenter. I'll come back to you. Okay. you you've, you've had every opportunity to respond, and I would like you to just follow procedure here, and everything's going to be fine. Dr. Carpenter. I'm afraid I don't have any specific information on rates in children. Thank you. Dr. Hoover. Well, I was just going to say that I can certainly send the rates from the SEER program to the committee for the record uh, when I go back to over age specific rates over time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, when you send that, Dr. Hoover, the subcommittee, unfortunately, did not receive a copy of your written testimony. Uh, and of course, it's customary to provide the committees with written testimony before a witness appears. Um, that didn't happen, and I'm asking on behalf of the subcommittee if you'll provide the subcommittee with your written testimony within the next five business days so we may include it in the record of this hearing. Yeah, we did send you the, f the f NCI fact sheet, which was generated by myself and others, which would be the, basically the, the substance of such a uh, written record. You know, maybe it wasn't explained to you, but a, a narrative explaining that is also helpful. So if you could submit us uh, to the subcommittee written testimony, we'd be very grateful. Okay, good. I, we, we did clear it with the committee, subcommittee, because of the kind of, I know we were a substitute for somebody else. Well, I'm grateful was, that you're here. It was late we time. Are. Thank you, Dr. Hoover. Uh, I'd like to ask a, a question that may seem technical, but it has uh, uh, very serious implications. Uh, the FCC sets an absorption uh, level called the specific absorption level of 1.6 watts per kilogram. That's the exposure limit. Uh, is that correct, Dr. Mr. Knapp? No, just yes or no? Yes. Okay. That number was calculated assuming that the only way uh, radio frequency emissions could inflict harm would be to heat the tissue, similar to the way that a microwave heats food. Uh, what, and, I, and this question is directed to, um, uh, uh, to any of the witnesses, what evidence is there that cell phones can cause biological responses in ways that do not involve heating of the tissue? What health effects or biological responses are potentially implicated? Uh, which of the witnesses would like to answer that question? Mr. Dr. Carpenter. There are literally hundreds of experimental studies in animal model systems and in isolated cells that show biological effects of radiofrequency radiation at levels that do not cause tissue heating. Uh, not all of those effects are, ne are necessarily harmful. I think the strongest evidence that there is reason to be concerned in humans is the evidence on the association between brain tumors and cell phone use because while the, uh, the energy of the cell phones has gone down over time, the, uh, the evidence is really quite strong. And I should say that uh, this is not just Dr. Hardell. There are studies from other investigators in Finland, in Sweden, in Germany, in France that show this elevation in brain cancer risk after more than 10 years of exposure. But I think that evidence is what concerns me most because those are exposures that fall within the current FCC guidelines. Uh, Dr. Herberman, do you wish to respond? Well, I have uh, very much uh, enjoyed the opportunity to uh, review the publications in the Bioinitiatives report that Dr. Carpenter played a lead role in. And I have been impressed that there are quite a number of studies, both at the cellular level but also at animal levels, indicating that uh, there is uh, effects and damage 
And the thing that has struck me the most, uh, and I think this is important to have in the record, is there are several reports from very experienced, credible scientists of damage to the DNA, which we know is a central uh, mechanism for uh, developing uh, tumors and uh, malignant cancer. And this is surprising at one level because uh, uh, one wouldn't have expected that from non-ionizing radiation, which the radio frequencies are. How would that? How would that happen? I mean, if you could, you know, we're laymen here. If you could just very briefly describe how it's possible that uh, the radio frequencies uh, from a cell phone could conceivably have an effect on uh, on changing or damaging DNA. My favorite hypothesis about this, but it needs to be experimentally tested, is that this could be uh, generating what we refer to as reactive oxygen species to uh, separate the, the oxygen from the hydrogen and water, uh, which then has the ability to uh, damage the DNA. And uh, this needs to be uh, demonstrated, but I think this is a very plausible explanation. Uh, Dr. Hoover, your response. Yeah, uh, it, there are certainly biological effects of, of radio uh, emissions, and, and I think the, I agree with the others that the question is, are they, are they things that might be related to cancer risk? And that's what hasn't been vetted well yet in the laboratory, and which is, uh, would be really useful to, uh, to, to understand underlying biologic mechanisms. And I know that very recently there has been these reports of um, ability to actually uh, do genetic damage, and uh, some of them, I guess, are currently under scrutiny as to whether they might be withdrawn or not. So I think the area is actually still evolving. Th thank you, uh, Dr. Hoover. Um, can I answer that as a layperson? Because one scientist did explain it to me. Sure. I was explained that cellular radiation is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the only technology now that we have that combines two different radiation waves. They travel in two different paths or two different waves. Am I correct in saying that? And it combines the two. Would anyone like to respond? And our brain are not equipped to handle that. Anyone respond to that? It, it just gets a little complicated. There's a very technical, there's an electrical and a magnetic component to a wave. So technically that's true. So radio frequencies and electromagnetic. It, it, except that it's the radio portion of the wave that propagates through space. The is, is what you said essentially true? That there's two components to it. Yes, a magnetic, I'm sorry that it's getting so technical. Well, no, I mean, actually, uh, technical relates to science, relates right. to health effects, so yeah, there's here we a, are. There's a magnetic component that usually propagates a very short distance. Um, Mr. Knapp, one of the concerns about the current specific absorption rate is that they assume the person who is exposed is a six foot tall man. Uh, does that make the allowable exposure limit higher or lower? The, the limit is a flat limit. So it doesn't vary. Well, we just, it's, we it's just heard, device. Di you know, Mr. Knapp, we just heard testimony that there are varying effects based on uh, the thickness of, let's say, the adult skull versus a child's skull. Isn't that the testimony we've heard here? So you've heard that testimony. You have, you know, there is established by the FCC a specific absorption rate. What do you have to say, now that you've heard this testimony, do you think that the allowable exposure limit should be higher or lower, or uh, is there, based on what you've heard, uh, is there evidence in what, based on what you've heard that children are more vulnerable than adults? And that might cause uh, the FCC to have to take that into account in constructing your specific absorption rate, which is the exposure limit that you enforce. 
Mr. Knapp. The, the standard that's in place is based on uh, an industry recommended and recommended by other federal agencies accepted standard. It has a margin built in to that when, standard. When, when, uh, when was that standard developed? When was the baseline for that standard? It was 1997. Uh, there's also been ongoing work. There, uh, the IEEE has developed a subsequent standard, but it is actually more lenient than our current standard. Have you, uh, when you say that the industry uh, recommended it, uh, what, did, is that, did you just testify to that? I, uh, when I said industry, perhaps that was an imprecise word because these were an IEEE committee that's open to all uh, Would you explain to uh, people what the IEEE is? Yeah, I, it's a uh, professional s society that develops standards, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Uh, it follows the American National Standards Guidelines so that it has to be open to all who want to participate. It includes members of government, users, uh, and, and manufacturers, uh, and health specialists. So it, it, it's developed by a broad range of experts. Right. And this was established, as you said, in 1997. Correct. Uh, you've heard testimony here in uh, September of 2008, 11 years later, that indicates that with respect to children, uh, there is a uh, increased likelihood of uh, adverse health effects. Uh, having heard that testimony, how would you choose to proceed uh, with respect to uh, the exposure limits that the FCC sets on a specific absorption rate? The, the FCC doesn't have the expertise to evaluate whether the standard is uh, uh, appropriate protection level for the cases that were discussed here. So and, where, where, and so where do you get the expertise? Uh, from the, I think, the other federal agencies that are conducting ongoing research okay, and their thank, work with the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knapp. Uh, Congresswoman Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's a uh, a nexus right into the question that's on my mind. Uh, any of you, can you tell us about the research and the studies that are currently taking place and when can we expect results and are there any being initiated through one of our federal agencies? Whoever would like to respond. I think I can probably answer that well. Uh, there are a number of studies, has already been mentioned, this Interphone study, it's a, com it's a partnership between the World Health Organization and the cell phone industry. It's going on in a number of countries in Europe, also in Israel and Australia. Uh, the report was expected about two years ago and there have been uh, preliminary reports released from some of these studies and the, the latest gossip, at least, is that the, the members of the committee that are supposed to write the final report uh, cannot agree. And nobody knows when this final report will be out. Uh, one of the surprising findings is that for short-term use, uh, many of these studies are showing a protective effect. In other words, fewer cases of brain cancer. That doesn't have any biologic sense. So it probably indicates a fault in the design of all of those studies. When you say short-term use, what do you mean? Less than 10 years. Uh, and Using a cell phone for less than 10 years. That's correct. Now, the, some of those studies are getting information on more than 10 years, but apparently what they're finding is that it looks like in the short term, it protects you from brain cancer, and then as time goes on, as you use it longer and longer, it gets nearer, it gets higher, but it never gets to statistical significance in all of those studies. So that may reflect a real increase in risk with prolonged time, but it's, it's still uncertain, and we are all waiting for the full results to come out, which may come out sometime in the, in the next year. Would there be a difference in a person, say, that uses a cell phone when you said short-term use? 
Uh, I'm talking, I'm thinking of the use of the cell phone, an individual, not the years that that cell phone has been used by an individual, but the use of time on your cell phone. Well, our understanding is that like any other environmental exposure, it's both how much time for how many years and also there's a factor the of, of calls. we're not all the same genetically so there's a matter of variations in susceptibility and these are all issues that have to be factored in and that's why you need a large number of cases to uh, really uh, factor out the, the things that influence the, the risk of cancer. Well, you, you mentioned the World Health Organization and other countries. Are there any studies being initiated here, FCC, FDA, at the universities? I'm not aware of any studies in the U.S. The National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences did support a program uh, on EMFs, but that ended in the, 19, in the late 1980s, 1990s, and there has been almost no attention to this issue in the U.S. And this, in my judgment, is urgently needed with the best possible exposure assessment. Uh, if, if I could just add a little bit please. to what Dr. Carpenter said. I agree completely with what uh, his last uh, remarks were. We urgently need such a study, and that's what uh, I was alluding to at the end of my uh, testimony. Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, my colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute are planning particularly together with epidemiologists at MD Anderson Cancer Institute, uh, but it would require the uh, cooperation of the, uh, the wireless industry would be to uh, obtain the billing records of use. Uh, we know from other types of medical outcome studies that billing records are the most accurate uh, objective indication of uh, use of uh, various procedures and rather than rely on likely faulty recollections, uh, uh, the billers get it right all the time. They have the records of how much, how long, and that type of information that could be linked with other information that you have to get a history on, like is there also use of cordless phones and how much is that uh, used, would I think uh, uh, take us a substantial distance towards a better, more definitive study than the ones that have been done so far. Thank you. Would you yield me just another second to kind of summarize what I'm thinking? General, Mr. lady may proceed. Uh, you know, I think back to the years that it took us in California to study the effects of tobacco, 14 years, and California was the first state to come out with the no smoking policy and I remember under Governor Jerry Brown it was no smoking on planes in California airspace. It has spread now globally. Uh, lead, asbestos and so on. And I'm thinking is the industry so powerful that they have uh, not wanted to uh, engage in looking at the risk that comes about from high technology and uh, what I think we ought to do, and uh, certainly our chairman is very, very experienced in coming out with innovative approaches, but I think we ought to, as a committee, recommend to the FCC or the FDA or the National Institutes of Health that we start looking into these studies. I think we need to drive this, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, uh, just to respond to my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Watson, uh, we will. And I, I also want to let you know that staff has informed us that uh, most, if not all, cell phones currently come with some kind of a uh, warning from the FDA. Uh, that may be. Uh, because of uh, more recent more research that might be more recent than the FCC relies on for its specific absorption rate. So uh, one of the things we'll need to do is to get these agencies to communicate with each other. That's number one. But something uh, that, that has come 
uh, from this committee I'm going to comment on when I conclude these questions. Uh, I, I want uh, to just ask you to, you know, put yourself in a, in a mother or father's shoes. Uh, you're told to protect your children from certain TV programs, chemicals in the water and food, chemicals in the air. Parents have to protect the child from more things than we could even mention uh, here today. Now, uh, what we're doing in this hearing is empowering people with scientific information to um, further protect themselves. But, but is that realistic? Uh, should the onus be on the cell phone user, or should the onus be on the companies that profit from uh, this technology? Should they bear some burden? Uh, what should they do? Uh, I would like to uh, hear a response to that uh, question, starting with uh, Dr. Hoover and going uh, down the line to uh, Ms. Marks, and if you could each keep your response brief. Well, I think certainly uh, knowledge is, and particularly knowledge disseminated uh, to the public is good, and people can actually make personal decisions because obviously personal decisions about risk are widely variable. Um, even in this area there are still people who uh, talk on cell phones when they're in cars and there's overwhelming evidence that that's a very bad thing to do. Uh, so I think the, that there, there is value to pushing out good information of what we know and what we don't know uh, so people can make those kind of risk uh, decisions themselves. I think the, in the area of making public health recommendations uh, is a lot trickier because the standard is usually quite a bit higher, uh, mainly because uh, people believe that if it comes out as a public health recommendation, there is a whole lot of science behind it. And we undercut ourselves if we don't demand that sort of science to uh, make our public health recommendations. I, I know I've been in, embroiled in uh, saccharin and, and bladder cancer and coffee drinking and pancreatic cancer, which had a fairly large uh, constituency and evidence that someone should do something, but, uh, but the science was not there yet. And as the science got there, it became le less true. Uh, and I, so I, I believe that there are two paths to go down. One is to get the information out so that people can make, can see what the level of evidence is and isn't. Uh, and make personal decisions, and to improve on what is really currently uh, lack of adequate enough scientific evidence to move to a to a solid public health record. Thank you, Dr. Herberman. I I would urge that this uh, committee uh, use its uh, powers of persuasion uh, with the uh, cell phone industry to uh, fully cooperate uh, in the design of uh, independent studies done by academia, as I uh, described a minute ago, to really get the answer. And uh, if the answer is that there is no uh, connection between cancer and uh, cell phone use, I'd be absolutely delighted. But I think we have to get the answer, and uh, getting the billing records and the cooperation of the industry, I think, is very important. Thank you. Dr. Carpenter. I think there are three levels that are important. Certainly education of the public is important. Uh, I think that it is really incumbent on the industry to take steps to find ways in which we can still use our cell phones but without greater risk. And then finally, and perhaps in my judgment most importantly, I think there is a major responsibility of government. And I would point to my colleagues at the FCC. Uh, their assumption that there is no adverse effect except tissue heating is simply wrong. And it comes from, as Mr. Knapp said, from the IEEE. This is a bunch of engineers. They are not people that have a health background. They may have some health advisors. But it isn't the engineering community that should be setting the health standards. And I am firmly convinced that the ultimate protector of the public has to be government. And there, there are a number of other government agencies involved, but uh, the, I think all three things are important. Mr. Knapp? Yeah. Um, the, the standards that we're applying are based on 
what has been recommended not only by the IEEE and supported by other federal agencies, uh, but that's what we've been advised is the appropriate level and that's what we're applying uh, to ensure that the products do comply with those levels as they go out the door. We absolutely support continuing research into this. In fact, the FDA had tasked the National Academies to make recommendations for further uh, study and one of the first areas that they identified was continuing research relative to Judas. We completely su uh, support the further analysis of, of this issue. Mrs. Marks. Well, as a parent, I feel that the responsibility lies with our government and the cell phone industry. Um, I'm, I'm unaware of the thing that you mentioned about the FDA. I didn't feel that this fell entirely under their jurisdiction. I'm not aware that they are supplying warnings, so perhaps I'm wrong, but I wasn't I, I'm, I'm, I've been told by staff that there is some language in some of the um, uh, manu instruction Fine, manuals for the cell phones, if, you know, I don't, uh, but language in an instruction manual, which may not really, mm -hmm. many not people may not see, right. is a little bit different uh, than a warning. Right. Um, also, I worry terribly about children, but I, I feel that their parents should be the one regulating their use per government and cell phone industry warnings. Um, I also worry terribly about children who are going to be losing parents to this, such as my children. And I, as much as I love children and I want to protect them, I think that we have to consider that also. And I thank you and I hope that we can make some changes. Uh, th thank you. Does my colleague, uh, Congressman Watson, have any closing remarks here? Let me just say how much I appreciate uh, the testimony here today. I think it opens up uh, our eyes as to what our responsibility should be. Government plays a tremendous role. I'm thinking about China now and the babies that have died and gotten sick because there wasn't the oversight or the monitoring and what they put in the formulas. That they, and I think about Similax in the 70s that was given to babies uh, in Africa. And I'm just saying, where is the public's responsibility and government's responsibility to protect the public's health? And I'm just appalled that studies have not been initiated. And I think I know why. Because industry now, and you know, people have made millions off of these high technological devices without really taking time to look at their long range effect. And I think that it's incumbent on us, Mr. Chairman, and I know that you share those thoughts as well. I, I you demonstrated them in the past. So I, thank you very much. And I would uh, like to thank our witnesses for the time they spent with us today. I, I thank the gentlelady. I want to note for the record, uh, apropos of what Dr. Herberman and uh, Dr. Carpenter have mentioned, uh, that in preparing her testimony that Mrs. Marks uh, did submit to this subcommittee extensive medical records of her husband, extensive cell phone records of her husband, and has um, and the committee uh, will of course review those uh, because it, it may be that uh, uh, that a kind of evidentiary track will be quite significant in being able to continue our work uh, to be able to uh, uh, see if uh, there is a case made for um, a stronger action. I also want to say in, in conclusion, you know, certainly thank all the witnesses. Uh, each of you has brought something to this hearing that has been quite important. Uh, Mrs. Marks, uh, your family has suffered greatly and I just want you to know on a personal basis that uh, I'm very impressed with your courage in coming here and telling this story. It can't be easy to do that. It's not, I, and I, I thank you. I, I, I just want to note that, that it's uh, much appreciated that you would uh, care enough to bring your story to this committee and to back it up with facts. Uh, each of the uh, witnesses has uh, presented information that's going to be very valuable to us. I want you to know that this subcommittee will continue to retain jurisdiction over this matter. We will continue to seek the cooperation of the industry. They will be given another opportunity to testify. 
and they will be asked to provide records with respect to uh, these health issues. Uh, so we are not going to let this matter rest. I want to take a note particularly uh, about what information has been presented with respect to the possible adverse health effects about, about, uh, concerning children. Uh, that is an area that uh, has, I think, some urgent import. And I will be discussing this matter with other congressional leaders uh, with respect to that. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for your presence. I am Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, this has uh, been a hearing of the subcommittee on the topic of tumors and cell phone use, what the science says. Uh, again, thanks to all of you in attendance. This committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, Thank my you. My family is, lines up so much with your family. So I really feel Going live.